Hey guys, John here. Welcome back to the Pigments Drum Week. Today we're talking about snare drums. So for this sound is more so an acoustic type of snare. Now keep in mind when synthesizing drums, snares are probably going to give you the most trouble. So hopefully this video can kind of help you out a little bit with that. And with that being said, here is the track again in case you missed it from yesterday. I think you get the idea. So let's dive into the snare drum and see what it's all about. So as I mentioned before in the kick drum video, the routing in pigments is a little bit different than our standard patches usually are. Now, with that being said, our filter routing is different on yours. This might say some, ours says split here, and that's because filter one is going to FXA and then filter two is going to FXB. So that way we, we can use our different engines to affect the different engine sounds separately. And then at the very end, we can combine them into a co cohesive sound. So with that being said, let's take a look at what makes a snare drum. And it's kind of similar to the uh, to the kick drum where we have the attack, we have the hitting of the actual head of the drum with the drum stick, and then we have the resonant tone of the shell of the of the snare drum, and we also have those that kind of like rattly, noisy sounds, right? The that the makes a snare a snare. You know, you take the snares off the bottom of a snare. It's basically a tom drum or a bongo or something like that. So those rattles are really defining that makes a snare a snare, right? And the reverb too is really gonna be helpful to kind of tie everything in. But before we even get to the effects in the reverb, we need to first start synthesizing the sound here. So with that being said, we have two different kind of things we need to talk about. We have the resonant tone, and then we have our noise and our attack, right? So our utility engine here is going to be used with a noise carrier, we're gonna to get to that. Then we have engine two, which is gonna be using FM, which we're gonna to get to that as well. And then over here, engine number one is gonna be our fundamental tone. It's going to be that here. Let's turn off this reverb here because that can be a little bit distracting here. Let's turn this off for now. So we basically just have this sound. And we're going to go over some of these effects here, the compression and all that in just a second. But in this engine number one, we're on wavetable, but we're actually not using the wavetable. So this volume's all the way down. We're using the modulator here. And if we go on tune, we can select this and then go to Hertz and then enter our specific value. And then modulate this volume on and off with an envelope to really get that tone. Now, any type of snare drum, they're going to have different fundamental tones. As we mentioned before, our kick drum was 49 hertz, which was a G. So if we look at snare drums, and even if you search different types of snare drums or, you know, what's their fundamental frequency, what's their tone, it's usually going to land anywhere from 170 hertz to about 200. So that's about a decent range, right? So for this one specifically, this is 196. So four hertz lower than uh, kind of your higher end 200 resonant shells, right? Now this is this is very important because depending on how our song sounds, we can say I like the snare drum, I like the contour, the snappiness, whatever it is, but it's a little bit too high pitched. I wish it was a little bit lower pitched, and this is going to be the knob that you would come to to change something like that. So if you're making samples or whatever it is you're doing, and the snare is cool, but it's just a little too high pitched or not high pitched enough, this is going to be the knob that you're going to want to reach for. But also try to stay between 170 and 200 hertz, and just kind of see what feels right with your track. And the same principle applies as it did with the kick drum. We're using a function at 0 0.05, so a very tiny amount to do that, that little pitch, pitch dive right there. And we see, you can see it on the spectrum here how it kind of curves a little bit. So let's look at that function here. So what's happening here is a slightly different curve from the kick drum. Now, the kick drum was kind of just a linear mo motion here. So this one is kind of divided in half, brought all the way down, and it kind of looks more so like a little slope, and then it flatlines over here. The speed is going to be 8.37 hertz, and that's important because if we change tempos, we don't want this pitch envelope following that same change as well because this is this this change, this modulation is specific to the sound, not to the song, right? So we want to keep this on hertz and nothing as far as syncing or any of these things down here. So always keep that on hertz. You can always change it from, from this value here to kind of change it to your liking, but always stay in hertz because if you change your BPM, you're going to change your sound and we don't really want that to happen. Moving on from there, we have the volume here. So this is going to be important too. The modulation is crucial in making different types of drum sounds, right? So envelope two, let's take a look at that over here. So envelope two, we have the attack at 6.1 milliseconds, the decay 500 milliseconds, sustain zero, and the release 100. So 
This curve here is minus 5.84, and you're going to be spending a lot of time adjusting these curves because they're very, very important. Sometimes when we make sounds, we don't really think about the curves too much, but in something like this, we really want to pay attention to that. So this second envelope here is going to be modulating the volume here for, for uh, this modulator here. So the, the volume that we hear for that tone, as you can see that move in there. And then this gets sent to filter number one. Now for the kick drum, we didn't necessarily really need to do some filtering because we already had our low end. It was kind of the sine wave, it worked fine. Here is a little bit different. We're using the MS-20 on a high pass to get a little bit more resonance boost on that fundamental here. So the resonance is 0.396 and the cutoff is around 173. So it's pretty close to 196, right? So it's boosting a little bit around that fundamental spot for that snare drum to kind of make it sound a little bit more beefy. So here's with the filter, here's without it. Slight little change, but also very important once we add a lot of those slight uh, different changes over time. So now that is going to be fed into FXA, which is a hard clip distortion at a, at a small amount, right? We have the drive all the way to the top for sure, but our drive is going to be 15.5 dB. It's not even halfway on this knob here. So pretty cool. And also keep in mind, it doesn't matter what key you press, it's gonna stay the same pitch and that's because this is in Hertz. So I don't know if, if you were curious about that, but I thought I'd mention that, that it popped in my head. So let's disable this engine number one and let's look at engine number two. So again, this is using a combination of frequency modulation to create that texture of the, of the rattles, the hitting the actual snare drum. And we're using some noise here on 0.808 Ooh, kind of funny, right? Uh, for the noise here. And uh, yeah, so we have this volume all the way to the top for the noise, but we also have the engine volume modulated with envelope number three. And it's gonna sound kind of like that, kind of almost metallic-y sounding. So this one here is getting sent to filter number two, and that's gonna be the SEM filter. The cutoff is going to be at 2,591 and the resonance at 0 0.420. <laughs> How about that? So the important part about this filter, especially with snare drums, it, this, this is gonna set your tonality of how you want that rattle to sound. The more you change this cutoff, the more that's gonna change the sound. So take a listen to this. So this is 2591. So based just on that, that's gonna change that initial rattle sound. So that's a very, very meticulous knob you wanna be aware of, as well as the resonance of how we accentuate that. Now this interesting spot for the frequency modulation is I feel like it gives a little bit more unpredictable timbre than just a noise oscillator. It almost sounds a little bit more realistic to me. So we're gonna have these uh, these key follows off and both of these oscillators one and two are gonna be up 100%. They're gonna be both on these triangle waves as well as the modulator number three is also gonna be on the triangle wave. Now this coarse tuning is at Plus ten, uh, plus 10 semitones, and this is a lot of trial and error, right? Just moving the knobs, kind of finding where the right spot could be. As we change this, it's also gonna change the tonality. So something we do want to slowly adjust, and over time you're gonna develop more so an intuitive idea of kind of how you want that to sound. So that's basically this engine number two in a nutshell. And now let's take a look at the utility engine. So this is kind of like the kick drum where we're adding a little bit more extra attack here. So for number two, we're using the frequency modulation, a little bit of the noise oscillator here, and then also some noise carrier for this sample right over here. And kind of cranking the high pass up to 34%. And also this is gonna be envelope three. So remember that engine two and the utility engine are both gonna be modulated by envelope number three. And there's a specific reason for that as we see envelope number three. So this attack here is 1.2 milliseconds, right? And we look at this attack and it's six one. So what's kind of happening here is this rattle sound, it's getting hit a little bit first, right? So we hear that almost a few milliseconds first, and then we hear the fundamental tone a little bit after that, right? So 
we kind of have to think in time, right? So once you have that stick that hits that snare drum, it's, you're initially going to hear that crack and then the kind of the lower tones start to come a little bit after that. So, and it's also nice to keep those tones a little bit separated slightly so they kind of have their own spots. So I thought I'd mention that as well. The decay is going to be three, four, three milliseconds, sustain zero, release 100, and then the decay curve, very important, minus 4.40. And then all together with these three, we have a snare drum. Now, after that, we do need to talk about some of these effects here. So if we turn off the low end, the fundamental of the snare, when we just have this, there's a lot more processing that's happening to this tone as far as the fundamentals. So let's take a look at FXB. So first it hits a distortion. So without this, that's that tone we generate a dry tone here. A little distortion. Gives it a little bit more rattly, maybe metallic-y kind of sound to that. The dry wet knob is all the way to the top, all the way, all the way 100%. The drive 41.6 dB, and no filter for that. Next, we're, we're going to be using a multi-filter here. So this is going to be a comb filter. And this one is very, very, very subtle, but it gives a little bit more metallic-y feel to it. Again, a very, very minuscule change, but the more you add minuscule changes, it becomes a whole thing. So dry wets all the way to the top. The Q is going to be 0 0.760. Comb uh, frequency is 62.8. And then it's going to be on the comb feedback right over here. So the bottom middle one there. Next, uh, last but not least for the... Uh, for the snare kind of sound, we have another multi-filter, but this one is going to be a notch filter at uh, 12 dB here. Now this kind of changes it almost from a clap sound to more of a snare sound. Kind of listen closely to this here. Now it's a little bit of change in that, in that notch filter here that really kind of makes that sound come alive. The dry wet is all the way to the top at 100%. The Q is 0.707, cutoff is at about 1K, which it comes default at 1K and it almost sounds perfect. So it's, it's nice that a default value comes at the right spot that we, that we want it to. It doesn't really happen often that way. So now we have our basic shapes. We have our low end fundamental tone at about 196, I think it was, with our little uh, slight pitch modulation. Then we have the two other engines, number two and the utility creating our attack, our noise. We put all these together and then we send these, as you can see this auxiliary send, which is in another bank of three different effects that we can use. And the send is 100%, so 0.00 dB, and then the return is also zero. So what happens here is it first hits an EQ. So if we take this off, this is kind of the, both tones ran through both of their individual effects before it gets hit through the master. It's like, okay, we have a decent sound. Okay, so now we want to glue some kind of stuff together. So we have an EQ here first. So a lot of these values are kind of really to ear, but if you'd like to know for exact values, the gain for this first band is 1.86 dB at 646 hertz, and then the second one is pushing 4.8 dB at around 2.274, and I don't think we're doing any of the other ones. Yeah, those ones are going to be down. And then last, or not last, but after this one, we have a compressor. So this is kind of going to be the glue to it here. So here's before compression, and then after. It really helps glue it and kind of bring out that transient. So right here, our threshold, and this is kind of arbitrary to the signal, but right here, it's negative 22.2 dB. The ratio is almost five to one, and our attack is at seven. So if we kind of look over here with, with these different types of attack here, our first one's going to be 1.2 for this uh, for the for the snares actually for that noise. So that's going to happen, and then the compressor is going to happen right after our low end. So our low end re is really at 6.1 milliseconds. Then we look at our compressor, and that attack is at seven. So it's a little further. So we have the the transient, and our low end starts, and then we start to compress it. Then we have our release at 29.4 milliseconds. And as I said, this is kind of arbitrary with the threshold and how much you want to compress, but yeah, that's kind of how I've done this here. And then last but not least, the main thing that's really gonna tie it in is a good reverb that has, uh, I guess, settings that are more so, more so tailored to that reverb. So let's take a listen to the reverb. 
Now it almost sounds like it's in a room, right? So let's take a look at our settings here. So we have our pre-delay at 17 milliseconds, and that's kind of a good healthy zone for a snare jump. So we have the whole snare that hits, and then we have a small amount of time, and then our reverb starts to, starts to play. Our size, that's definitely arbitrary because how big do you want your room? In this case, it's 0.345. The decay is 0.529, stereo width all the way to the right. I didn't change any of the high pass frequency, but I did kind of mess a little bit here for the low pass at 3592 hertz. And also the dampening is definitely two choice as well. Right here it's 0.664. So that's kind of really the, the creme de la creme, the kind of final screws of the snare is getting the right reverb on it. And this dry wet's gonna be at about 40%. We can always take it down, have it dry, and then kind of decide how much reverb we want to this. But around there, maybe, uh, what, what was that at before? 40% seems fine. So that's kind of the main concepts behind the snare drum. Now, these are gonna be a little bit more challenging to make than kick drums or snare, or kick drums and tom drums because there's that different rattliness and just the physics of what goes behind snare drums is quite complex. There's a whole article on sound on sound synthesis and talking about snare drums, and it's far more complicated than you actually really think to make a more accurate acoustic snare drum. But also with that complicatedness in mind, remember that you're going to have a whole track playing as well, and there's going to be a lot of stuff happening, so no one's going to be sitting there critically with a microscope looking at your kick drum and like, oh, okay, you know what? Your attack on your reverb was, the pre-delay was 20 milliseconds, or it should have been 17 or something stupid like that. So keep that in mind. There's going to be a lot of stuff going on. If it sounds initially good before the reverb, then you put the reverb on and put it in a track, it's going to sound pretty good. So with that being said, this is kind of what it would sound like all in context again. And from this point on, you can really change whatever you want to. Make sure to to if you want to keep if you want this preset, you can download it for free in the video description below. And then you can always alter it and save it as something new, so a different type of snare drum, change the tuning, or you can even t like record it, bring it back into pigments, and do something crazy with it or whatever it is you want to do. But yeah, so that's the foundation spot of making a snare drum, and that's kind of more so the uh, the goal you're trying to reach. Just get make sure to get that that low end fundamental tone correct. And I really like the process of using frequency modulation as well as noise, and then a little bit more noise for more attack for the rattles. I think it sounds a little bit better than just using noise. And then that reverb, make sure you get a nice reverb. I did this one in pigments. I would generally probably not use this reverb and then use maybe Valhalla Vintage Verb, something like that to make it sound a little bit better. But that's the uh, that's the main point. I wanted to make everything in-house within this patch here so you don't necessarily need to do any post-processing to it. So with that being said, hopefully you learned something and thank you for watching. The next video, we're going to be talking about hi-hats and then after that, we're going to be talking about symbols, which are related but also different. So thank you so much for watching. We'll see you in the next video.